Isaiah chapter 40. We'll be looking there here in just a few moments. Very good to be with you all this morning. Good to be back. Had a very good week this last week with the Northern Kentucky Church of Christ. And it's good to be back in the south. There's not a lot of sweet tea uh, that far north. And uh, so it's good to be back in the promised land, as they would say. It was a very encouraging week. I uh, was able to also, there at the tail end, be there for the studies in Murfreesboro, hear uh, Mr. Wes there finish out his lessons. So I look forward to going back and, and hearing all of those studies. This morning, uh, we are going to be looking, as the screen would tell you, on the subject of holiness, and in particular, as it pertains to God, as it pertains to our Heavenly Father. And this evening, we're going to be talking about how we, in light of that holiness, ought to act as holy, how we are to be holy as well. Now, the word holy is repeated many, many, many times throughout the Bible, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And when we talk about God, we talk about Him as being holy. He is holy. Your Bible, as, as mine does, might even have the word holy Bible on it. So God continually uses this word to describe not only himself, but also his people. Wherever God is, that place is holy. We go to the book of Leviticus, the most holy place is talked about in the holy place. Most holy, meaning uh, even holy, holy. So the, the holiest of all. We sing a, a hymn, oftentimes, holy, 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 uh, and that language is, is taken from two passages, Isaiah chapter 6 and also Revelation chapter 4. And these are the only times in Scripture that holy in that sequence, three, three times, it's the only time that phrase is said, holy, holy, holy. And the only time that phrase is used, it is applied to God. So it is uber-emphasized. It is, it is greatly significant. But first of all, what does holy even mean? What does holy even mean? Well, <clears throat> holiness, uh, as vines, and there are many other places we could go to define this word, but uh, vines, dictionary defines it as uh, to be blameless in character, to be separate to God, not from God, to be sanctified. Uh, now, with God in the book of Isaiah and Revelation as well, that repeating phrase, holy, 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 that is to say that God is not only blameless, not only is he righteous and good, but he is beyond anything and everything that we can possibly imagine with this word. Uh, if you know your numerology, if you've been through the book of Revelation, if you've been through many of the prophets of the Old Testament, then you know that uh, the number three is highly significant. This is a number uh, that signifies wholeness, completeness, especially as it pertains to God. So as soon as we think we understand the holiness of God, or we think that we have attained his holiness, we need to take a step back. And we need to listen, and we need to learn. We are to be holy as God is holy but as Paul says, we press on towards the upward call of God. We continue to improve, we continue to grow, we, we continue to learn. So looking at God in light of his holiness, God is holy in power and he is holy in wisdom. If you're there in Isaiah chapter 40, go ahead and read with me verse 12. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? measured heaven with a span and calculated the dust of the earth in a measure, weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. So here in this verse, we see that God's power is impossible to measure. It is immeasurable. So many points in scripture, especially in the book of Isaiah, talk about the hand of God. The hand of God uh, does this or the hand of God does that. And so with that, it infers that God is heavily involved in whatever is being talked about. It is active. And not only that, but his hand accomplishes great and awesome things. Here in verse 12 in Isaiah 40, it talks about water 
uh, in the hollow of the hand. Uh, <clears throat> this is a, a diagram of uh, the Mariana Trench, which is in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, it's seven miles deep at its lowest and at its deepest point. And, that, and if you want to uh, take that even further, that is deeper than Mount Everest is tall. This is a very deep trench. And I don't know about you, we talk about space, the final frontier. Some people are scared of, you know, things that are out there and whatnot. I'm, I'm more scared of the ocean than most things because there are things down there that we still haven't discovered. We continue to discover them. And you talk about going seven miles deep into, uh, into the ocean. This is, this is massively deep. And so God not only holds those waters in his hand, but he holds all of them in his hand, all of the waters. Coming back to Isaiah, he's measured the heavens with a span. Now, if you look at the word span, that is literally just the distance between your thumb and your pinky. And so you, you come to God, if you were to ask God how vast the heavens were, how big the sky was, God would simply just hold out his hand and say, it's about this big. This is holiness unmatched unfathomable for us to imagine. Now you put this, this word in the context of not only uh, the sky, but also space. We live on one planet amongst eight, poor Pluto, not considered one anymore. We've been to the moon several times as humankind. We talk about uh, life on earth and populating life on earth. So many of these private companies talk about doing that. And we say, look at us. Look at what we as mankind have been able to accomplish. And yet that is a short distance compared to the enormity of not only this solar system, but every other galaxy. There are billions of stars in this galaxy alone. This, uh, when I first uh, looked at this photo, you think, uh, oh, that's some fireflies. These are not only stars, but these are hundreds if not thousands of galaxies taken by the Hubble telescope just a few years ago. And this is just one frame that it took. This is not to say all the other uh, photographic images that it took on this particular journey. So we are one galaxy among an innumerable amount. We continue to discover these galaxies. Scientists have calculated that if you span the distance of each galaxy put together, it would be upwards of 90 billion light years across. As I've heard Paul Earnhardt talk about within the context of these types of things, he, he says this is like a peanut in God's pocket. This is nothing to him. He created all that we see around us and beyond with just a few words. He could have done it with one word. He could have, could have done it with the snap of his fingers. He could have done it any way he wanted. His power is immense. It is holy. It is separate. It is far beyond anything else. Coming back to Isaiah chapter 40, says there that he calculated the dust of the earth in a measure. This is the longest beach in the world in Praia de Casino Beach that stretches uh, from the southern border of Brazil all the way to the Rio Grande, which is about 130 miles uh, if you stretch that out to its farthest length. We cannot number the sand on just even one beach. Scientists have tried to do that. They've, they've estimated and calculated that 7.5 sextillion sand grains populate the earth. And if you want to know what that looks like, that's 75 with 17 zeros following it. This is not to mention, even if we include talking about coming back to the passage, calculated the dust of the earth in a measure. That's not to mention the dust that we as mankind were created out of, and to dust we shall return. We cannot fathom this. And yet God says that he has calculated it in a measure. We also see here what's described, that he weighed the mountains and scales and the hills in a balance. 
Go over to, uh, in the same chapter, chapter 40 in verses 22 and 26. We'll get to verses 13 and 14 here in a moment. Verses 22 and 26. It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. Who stretches out the heaven like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in? Come down to verse uh, 26. Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things, who brings out their host by number. He calls them all by name, by the greatness of his might and the strength of his power. Not one is missing. This is power beyond comprehension, beyond understanding. So then we come down uh, or back to verses 13 and 14. Who has directed the spirit of the Lord or as his counselor has taught him? With whom did he take counsel and who instructed him and taught him in the path of justice? Who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? God's knowledge and his wisdom are also beyond our comprehension. I'm currently 26. If I were to read one book for every week of my life until, say, I reach the age of 90, I would read well over 3,000 books. The Library of Congress, which is one of the largest libraries in the world, houses over 51 million books in its physical catalog. So by age 90, I will have only read about 0.005% of all of those books. God knows it all. Not only we talk about 51 million books cataloged in that library, that's just one library. God does not only know it, he created knowledge. He created wisdom. He did not have to take counsel. He did not have to learn this. He is the one from whom knowledge and wisdom originates. And not only does he know what's in all of those books, he knows everything there is to know about you, and he knows everything there is to know about me. He knows the hairs on your head. He knows all the freckles on your face. He knows your thoughts. He knows your intentions, your deepest secrets. If we go over to Romans chapter 11, if you want to put a marker there in Isaiah. <clears throat> Romans chapter 11. Look with me there in verse 33. <clears throat> Romans 11, verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has become his counselor? This is taken directly from Isaiah 40, verse 13. Or who has... Uh, first given to him, and it shall be repaid to him. For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. We are not dealing with anything from man. We are dealing with the one who created man. And so often, man will try to make God what they want him to be to suit their needs. They place limitations on God or they call him outdated, that he's old news, that God got this one wrong. However, we know the verse, Isaiah 55 and verse 8, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. God is holy in that he is so far removed from our ways that they are past finding out and that distance continues to get wider and wider, to gain distance. So we need to check our pride at the door before we approach God and realize who it is we are talking to, who it is we are approaching. He is holy in power and in wisdom. Well, <clears throat> God is also holy in righteousness. God is holy in righteousness. We are not worthy to stand before God. Coming back to the book of Isaiah, if you'll turn now over to Isaiah chapter 6, this is perhaps one of the more famous passages in all of the book of Isaiah. As Isaiah is first called here in this chapter, 
Look with me there in Isaiah chapter 6 in verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So we see here in Isaiah 6, the Lord is sitting on a throne where his robe fills the whole temple. The seraphim covered their faces before the Lord, because they are not worthy even. And Isaiah says, Woe is me, I am undone. What we are doing in this assembly this morning, it is a privilege. It is not something where we simply exercise the mind. It is not something to puff ourselves up. It's not for our own enjoyment. It's not for our own pleasure. It's not to make ourselves look good. This is for God. And we are not worthy. When we present ourselves to God with an honest, with an open heart, as we already looked in Isaiah chapter 40, we are as grasshoppers. And, and God is the proverbial elephant in the room. But that doesn't even begin to cover it. As soon as we affirm that we are worthy or maybe even more worthy than God, we condemn ourselves. We go over to the book of Leviticus, in Leviticus chapter 10, one of the only instances in that whole book where we have narrative. You remember there, uh, in Leviticus chapter 10, we have Nadab and Abihu. And what did Nadab and Abihu do? They go forward in great excitement, it would seem, after the tabernacle has been filled with the glory of the Lord. And yet they offer strange fire. They offer fire that is not authorized, has not been authorized by the Lord. And so what happens? They are consumed with fire from the Lord. People say, it's what I prefer. It's what I like. It's what makes me feel good. It's all about my experience. And I don't, I don't really care what that scripture says. I do like this over here, but I don't like this. The Lord says many times throughout the prophets that obedience is better than sacrifice. But if the Lord commands sacrifice, then we ought to obey that command, right? If we live our lives in accordance to God, that is a sweet, that is a swelling, uh, sweet smelling aroma to God, as Philippians chapter 4 in verse 8 tells us. But not only do we need to obey, as the prophets talk about so many times, the book of Malachi talks about this, we need to obey with the right attitude, the right motivation, the right kind of heart. And saying that we don't want to do it God's way, but that God should accept it anyway, is so hypocritical. One of the first conversations uh, that I had with Mr. Wes, um, I'm talking about coming, coming here, and this was a totally different conversation, not at all with this topic, but I, th I think it applies so well. He, he told a story, a, a, you know, a fake story, made up story about if you go to your favorite restaurant and it's under new management, you don't really know what to expect. Well, the new manager comes over to your table he has a dirty diaper in his hand, just about the dirtiest diaper you can imagine. He rubs that in your face for about five minutes, puts it down, and then you decide to walk up and leave. And the manager says, wait, where are you going? You turn around and you say, well, it's certainly not here. This is unacceptable. This is filthy. This is disgusting. Why, why would I accept this? Why would, it, why would I accept this service from you? God's ways are holy, and we are to be holy as he is. And that means trusting him and gladly accepting what he has given us, and gladly doing what he has told us to do. 
1 John chapter 1 uh, in verses 5 through 7 talk about this idea of God being light. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. God in his nature, in his holiness, cannot have anything to do with darkness, with sin. So for us to then bring him something that is not holy and us expecting him to accept it is, is so unreasonable and it is, with, it is without reason. He cannot accept it. He will not accept it. Now, if God were only holy in terms of power and knowledge and righteousness, we would be lacking in all of those categories. We are lacking in all of those categories. And we would just have to accept our fate that we are not as holy as he is. And we would accept our fate of eternal condemnation because I, I am a sinner. You are a sinner. There's nothing else. But fortunately, that is not all that God's holiness brings because God is also holy in grace and in mercy. You come back to Isaiah chapter 40. Look with me there in verses uh, 10 and 11. Isaiah 40 verses 10 and 11. Behold, the Lord God shall, uh, shall come with a strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm. You go back to the very first chapter of Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 1, in verses 2 through 4. Isaiah 1, in verse 2 Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not consider. Alas, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a brood of evildoers, children who are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked to anger the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away backward. Verse 3 is somewhat of a comical description of Israel here, but a sad one as well. The ox and the donkey, they both know their master. These dumb, stupid animals. And yet Israel does not know their own master. Well, then we come uh, to verses 16 through 18 of the same chapter. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. It is well within the right of God to allow us to wallow in our filth, to be condemned to hell where we certainly belong. But God, who desires a relationship with this kind of people, God, who knows all and remembers every word that we've ever said, remembers every word that he has ever given, he still wants us to pray to him, to know his words that he has preserved for us. He wants us to love him as he loves us. The same God who has all righteousness looks on the wickedness of man and still, still offers a way out. So no matter how much darkness you've taken part in, the Lord begs you that you come as you are in your filth, but then to turn and to leave changed, to be transformed, so that, as the passage goes, the famous passage, we sing this, this, uh, this hymn as well, to make us white as snow. You go over to John chapter 1 
in verse 14. Jesus is the express image of his person, that is, of God. He is God in the flesh, full of grace and truth. Jesus on the cross, as we have observed and we have remembered this morning, that image should remind us of the ugliness and the filth of sin and just how much that we as mankind have messed things up. But what that scene should also bring to mind is that God is holy in grace and mercy and that it was fully brought to man. God giving us breath at all is mercy. The fact that he allows us to voice our cares, to voice our worries, to give us or to allow us to petition him in prayer, that is mercy yet still. Now on the other side, he has given time to all men everywhere to repent even to those who willfully rebel against him. We're going through the divided kingdom, the, the tail end of the divided kingdom right now in the teenage class, and what, what do all the prophets give? What is their message? Judgment, but also repentance. He wants them to repent. He wants us to repent. He has given time. That is mercy. That is mercy that is so unmatched in the world. So God is holy. He is separate from all others because he exercises grace and mercy perfectly. Now we've talked about the immense nature of space, the, the books that we might read over our lifetime, all the books that are in the world. There are over 7.8 billion people in the world. Still growing. And God cares for each one. Not only does he care for each one, but he can think about each one individually at the same time. And he knows all there is to know about each one. So he knows each one of us intimately, personally. Not that he hopes to catch us in some sin whenever we fall and then to stamp our one-way ticket to hell. But he cares for us. He knows us. 7.8 billion people in the world, galaxies that span 90 billion light years across, life on Mars, life on these other planets. There are many that would look at all of those facts and those, those things that we continue to discover and say, surely we are not the only sentient beings in the universe. Surely we are not the only ones that salvation has been offered to, some would even venture to say. I think a more powerful truth is that despite everything that God has created, in this tiny speck in the universe, he has offered salvation to us, his special creation, made in his image, and Christ died for us. That is amazing. May we never forget it. May we never forget how small we are and how holy God is. And may we, in our humble and lowly state, observe ourselves as those grasshoppers and say, I need a Savior. I can't do it on my own. And I am not alone. Psalm 139 talks about uh, this idea of you formed my inward parts. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. God also says, he is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He has shown mercy that he has not destroyed each one of us. He's given us grace in that he gave us the gift of his son, which we did not deserve, which we do not deserve. And so we ought to show him, in turn, grace upon grace. Those things have been shown. Mercy and grace has been shown. And we did not do anything to achieve it. We did not do anything to earn it. We did not do it. God carried the whole load, and he offered the gift of his son freely to us. However, we still have to accept that gift. We still have to do something with it. God wants sons. That is, he wants heirs that would receive the inheritance, that would receive the promise, like unto the only begotten son. And we are joint heirs with him. 
that inheritance was lost in the garden. And ever since then, God has been trying to get his creation to wake up, to realize that he still loves us, that he still wants us to come back. And so mankind is fortunate that God did not start over, like so many times that he said he was going to. We are so lucky that that time has not come yet. There will come a day when we will no longer be here. So start that relationship now. Well, God sent his son not only that we might be forgiven, but that we might be changed, that we might be transformed, that we ourselves may become holy. We'll flesh this point more uh, out this evening as well. Coming back to Isaiah chapter 6. After Isaiah's confession to God, God offers up uh, an invitation, as it were. Isaiah 6, in verse 6, Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar, touched my mouth with it, and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away, and your sin purged. And then we'll continue on to that uh, invitation, as it were, here in verse 8. But uh, here, just briefly, we see here this seraphim. He takes this hot coal. He presses it to Isaiah's mouth. He says, Your iniquity is taken away. So we come to this passage and we say, is it that easy? Do we not have to do anything else than that? Well, if you look at the language of uh, what Isaiah does after this, it's not only pressed to his lips, and that, that is that, uh, what the seraphim says there, of your iniquity is taken away. Isaiah makes a confession, and in that he observed that he was wrong, that he was sinful, and he wanted to do right by changing. And that change of heart is what God is looking for. And so it's not, that, it's not that after that initial change of heart, Isaiah was good to go. He never had to do anything else after that. Once saved, always saved, right? And we continued on. Baptism is a first step in saying in many ways to God, I am committed wholly and completely to you, O King. Whatever you say, I will do. That's exactly what Isaiah says, continuing on down in verse 8. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I. Send me. This is a lifelong process. This is a transformation. There is a lifelong process of sanctification, which produces godliness and holiness. <clears throat> Now, like Isaiah, not everyone will share in that same heavenly vision. Not everyone will listen to reason. Not everyone will look at what we are doing here today as for God. But we go on anyway, in good faith, believing our Lord and doing his will. We'll talk about again this idea tonight, but God is separate from mankind in every way, and so God has called us as his people to be holy, to be separate. If you are here this morning, you find yourself not holy as God is holy. You find yourself as that grasshopper and God as the proverbial elephant, and you think there is no hope for you. Again, God has offered that hope. His son has died for us. You have the chance for your sins to be washed away in the waters of baptism. If you are in Christ, you have strayed from the path. And you have been reminded of those things that God is. God is wrathful. He is the great judge, but he is also full of grace and mercy. And we will help you in that. If you have a need this morning, won't you come as we stand and as we sing?